funds controlled by foreign governments is becoming a hot-button issue here in the United States. These funds account for roughly $2.5 trillion in assets, and it is growing exponentially. Members of Congress are concerned about ceding control of U.S. companies to foreign investments. And here to give us a clearer picture is Robert Kimmett. He's the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Treasury. Good morning. Good morning, Alexis. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here because I think you need to help us demystify what uh, some of the press is talking about. For all of us, uh, just like me, average viewers, explain to me, what exactly is a sovereign wealth fund? A sovereign wealth fund is a large pool of capital held by a foreign country, and it's managed separately from its official reserves. So this is money that they are looking to invest on a global basis. And what kind of financial assets usually make up a sovereign wealth fund? Well, generally, as the name implies, they are pools of capital, and generally then they are looking to invest them. They might put them into treasury bonds, but they might also want to diversify and get into equities. And that's what we're seeing now, that as these funds grow larger, people are naturally trying to diversify their portfolios. So let's talk about some of those investments, because clearly the main topic of discussion in the press has been investments in Citigroup and Merrill Lynch, of course, uh, UBS overseas in Europe. Um, should we be fearful of those investments? There's a great deal of concern that uh, as they grow in their dominance and the percentage of ownership in these corporations, that they perhaps can use their, uh, you know, economic investments for political objectives. Um, I think that would be a legitimate concern. But sovereign wealth funds have been around for over 50 years, and there's not a single instance of any effort of a sovereign wealth fund to use its investment for political purposes. They invest for commercial purposes. They're patient, long-term investors, not highly leveraged. That is, they don't have a lot of debt. They don't move their asset allocations around. What they're trying to do is to get higher investment returns without generating political controversy. But I think the real key thing to understand is that open investment is one of the great uh, strengths of the U.S. economy. These are people who want to invest in the U.S. economy, in the U.S. marketplace, in the American worker. And over 5 million Americans work for companies headquartered overseas. And for every $10 million invested, 30 new jobs are created directly and 30 indirectly. So we look at sovereign wealth funds in the context of an open investment policy that has served the American economy and, importantly, the American worker. Despite that, there are clearly concerns, and you must be hearing it from corporations and investors because there is the, the dialogue that you have started. You've met with several sovereign wealth funds. I know that there's a movement with the IMF and the World Bank to come up with some best practices. Where is the progress? I understand that the European Union is going to make some announcements in regards to that today. Um, and what do you hope to achieve with those best practices? The um, effort that is underway is to try to avoid a protectionist reaction to sovereign wealth funds that, as I say, thus far have been a very positive force in the world economy. What the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank are doing is working with the sovereign wealth funds to come up with a set of best practices that demonstrate clearly that they're investing for commercial and not political reasons. At the same time, we and the countries who receive investments are working to make clear that we're open to investment, provided that investment is made for commercial, not political reasons. I, I, I hate to be the skeptic in this situation, but to some degree, some are going to argue do we have a choice? When you look at some of the financial institutions in this country, uh, they needed cash. And the people that stepped up to the plate in many cases were those sovereign wealth funds. So how much leverage do we have at this state in, in the environment, particularly given the U.S. dollar, uh, to get them to the table to create these best practices? Well, they are at the table now working with us, the International Monetary Fund and others. I think the sovereign wealth funds, who after all are trying to generate better returns in a world economy in which they now have a greater stake, are being very cooperative in this effort. And let's talk about those investments. First of all, uh, the fact that they put money into U.S. banks is good news because that then allows U.S. banks to lend to individuals and uh, to companies to help get the economy growing. But secondly, look at the way they made their investments. In almost every case, they took less than 10 percent, didn't have board seats, and they were very sensitive to making these investments in a way that was acceptable. In other words, they pursued a commercial end, but with a political sensitivity. Do you think it is fair for sovereign wealth funds to have voting rights? 
on well, the board? I, what we have said uh, is that uh, it is appropriate for them to have voting rights commensurate with the uh, interest that they have in the uh, particular entity. But we have suggested that if they exercise those voting rights, they should do it in an open and transparent manner. Now, you said voting rights on a board. Those are really sort of two different There's two things. two different issues. Right. And thus far, sovereign wealth fund investments have been predominantly investments of a distinctive minority character without board seats. Without board seats. But do you think they have the right to have board seats if those percentages, as you suggest, get up to that 10 percent mark? Do they have a right to be on the board? Well, I think it would be appropriate for them to have board representation in appropriate cases. Again, we have a review process. Uh, under the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., it takes a look at any investment to make sure that if it raises any security concerns, those can be addressed. Uh, but again, to this point, the sovereign wealth funds are saying to us and to others, how can we invest in this tremendous American marketplace, but in a way that is politically acceptable and doesn't raise security concerns? You are going to speak today uh, with the U.S.-Israel Executive Summit. You're going to talk, uh, I'm sure, somewhat about the Iraq economy and about terrorist financing. Give us some kind of preview. Uh, what do you feel about that? Are you concerned about it? Um, and where do things stand? Well, first, the fact that I'm speaking at the U.S.-Israel Business Summit to a group of Israeli companies looking to invest in the United States goes back to the fundamental point that I made, and that is we have to be open to investment because the fundamental fact is foreign direct investment creates American jobs, and that's going to be the real message that I carry. With regard to terrorist financing, I was in Israel and elsewhere uh, in the Middle East uh, just two months ago. Uh, we are leading the effort to try to keep uh, illegal activity out of the world's banking system, whether it be terrorist finance, proliferation finance, or frankly drug dealing or organized crime. Uh, we work very closely not only with Israel but other countries in the Middle East uh, on this effort. We're going to continue to pursue that effort. And I would note that particularly with regard to Iran, that is supported by the world community. We've had two unanimous Security Council resolutions calling for Iran to move away from its nuclear program, and a third is now being negotiated. On the Iraqi economy, um, a publication recently said it was the mother of all surprises. This is an economy that is growing soundly. It has low inflation. Uh, they have oil production and exports up to pre-war levels. Uh, this is a rare post-conflict situation where money isn't the issue. The issue is developing the capacity to commit that money for the benefit of the uh, Iraqi people. And that means the security situation has to continue to improve. And as it has uh, improved, we're starting to see a real pickup in the Iraqi economy and, importantly, in investments. A, a real pickup in investment, particularly on behalf of the oil sector. All right. I got one most important question for you to wrap this up. Georgetown Hoyas right now, they're looking 10th in the ESPN poll, 11th in the AP poll. Are you feeling good going into March Madness? Uh, I'm feeling very good going in. I'm a Georgetown Law School graduate. I, I follow them quite closely. I will say I also watch very closely my West Point classmate, Mike Krzyzewski, and the Duke Blue Devils. I feel very good about both those teams going into March Madness. All right, so who you pick when it comes down to the end? Where is your allegiance? Uh, if it comes down to that game, I'll be there cheering very actively. All right, great. Well, it was a great...